That's why gold and silver is so important. The same thing that's going to happen to Joe Bag of Donuts is going to happen to large institutions. So I actually see them transitioning into metals themselves as collateral. And there's just not that. I mean, the allocation of, of, of GLD and SLV, it's like 0.004% or 5% by these major institutions. They don't have any, really any of them. Even BlackRock, it's trillions. The, this PSLV uh, uh, stake is very little. So it wouldn't take much to see that increase yeah. dr dramatically. Yeah, yeah. I've heard um, some others like Rick Rule uh, talk on, on how small the sector really is, and, and it doesn't take much inflow in order for it to explode. Um, economist Luke Groman recently shared a chart showing that SLV inventories are down by more than 70 million ounces since mid-2022. Steve, who's buying all of the silver? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Luke put that chart out showing the GLD. And actually, I made that SLV chart, chart showing the same thing was happening with the SLV. When I looked at the GLD, and I didn't know this, it was an institution selling since mid-2022. Their shares are about the same. They haven't really liquidated many of their holdings of the GLD. The SLV is a little bit lower, but it's not substantially lower. The, the decline in shares and metal out of the SLV and the GLD is hedge funds, high net worth individuals, and retail. That, because you know why? They're moving in. I think that this is my, my thinking, my analysis. They're moving into uh, yield, high yield assets like treasuries, money market accounts, and, and et cetera. So who's buying? Well, we know that India is still buying. They're not there. Sometimes they buy more. Sometimes I buy less. This they're buying in 2023 is what took a lot of silver off the LBMA. So, yes, India is buying. They like to buy when it's low. China's buying more. But the, the thing is, I don't see this as a bank run, as what kind of uh, Luke was saying. Right. I just see it as it's heading into the over the counter market. And even though we're getting more central bank there's still flows that are heading into the over-the-counter market, into, in, into different exchanges and vaults. And so uh, that, that's my analysis. But you'll know when the price of gold starts going back up, when ETF demand starts to come back in. And I don't, I'm not one that recommends people buy the ETF. I think they should own the physical, but that's not going to stop institutions from moving in there. And right. so when we start to see that flow back in, that's when I think we're going to see much higher prices. All right. Well, let's now move over our discussion over to oil. I believe you have a, a couple of charts for this, Steve. You wrote an article detailing why there is a one-to-one -one relationship between global oil production and GDP, that money supply and financial assets should grow in tandem with energy production, and they just haven't. What are the ramifications when this rule is broken? Gary, excellent question. Uh, and that, to understand what's going on, because uh, people think finance drives the economy, it doesn't, it steers the economy. And if we understand the, the economics profession doesn't seem to get that it's, it's energy growth that drives the GDP, if you don't have debt growth. So what we see here, I did this chart from 1950 to 2022, from 1950 to 1980, the green line is the GDP, and the yellow line is our, the total energy growth in the United States. Well, they're mirroring each other, and that's how it's supposed to happen. But And you look at the red line, there wasn't much increase in debt. The debt came after 1980, and what you see, the price of oil went up, the, the U.S. peaked in oil production, and then we had the recession, but then production started to increase or more consumption. But you'll notice the green line and the red line are moving in tandem. So the, 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 the energy wasn't moving up the GDP. It was the debt. Then after 2008, the global financial crisis, to me, this was the, uh, the first heart attack. And it, it all changed after that. And we see the GDP still going up. But look how quickly 
uh, how fast the debt is going up. And so that should be a red flag to people that this GDP is really not a good indicator of growth because it's been propped up by the debt. Now, I've got one more chart that takes it to the, the next level, and this is global. If we understand that energy production and consumption leads to GDP growth, this chart starts in 2007 before the global financial crisis. It starts at zero. And then I, I show the change to 2022. And we, had, we added 13 million barrels a day of growth, mostly from the United States and Canada. That's where it came from. So if they added the growth, that's where the GDP growth should come from, or that's where the, the, the energy comes from. The GDP, real GDP in the world grew by 28.1 trillion. It grew more in reference to the oil, but that was due to the debt printing as well. But worse yet, and this is why it's so important to understand this, the financial assets, and this is according to the SSB Global Monitoring Report uh, that came out in 2022, the global financial assets have increased 281 trillion, 10 times the GDP. So I'm a broken record here, Gary, but all I know when I get up in the morning, all the energy I use or people, the market uses, it's to produce goods and services. That's, that's all we do. Build homes, build cars, buy cars, buy jeans, buy clothes, use the internet, you know, heat the home. That's all we have. We've got just enough energy, that 13 million barrels a day of oil, and then the coal and natural gas, it's there just to produce the goods and services. Unfortunately, it can't settle all that finance. And that's the issue that the market doesn't understand. Even though the market continues to pile into finance, treasuries are finance, we can't settle that. That's why gold and silver is so important because that gold and silver, most of that gold is still there. The gold is there and it continues to grow. We have more gold in the system. That's still going to be there. All this finance is going to get into serious trouble. So I want people to understand this is the reason why we should be considering transitioning more to physical assets. So I, I just wanted to share those two charts. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Um, so can you describe the serious trouble that you're talking about? So what are you seeing happening for the everyday person out there that's listening? What, what should they expect to be experiencing? Well, we're, we're getting the, the inflation and look at the CPI numbers. They didn't, I mean, there they was kind of, it, it was worse than what the market realized. I think inflation is going to be sticky. And so the more the central banks, I mean, the U.S. Treasury added $2.4 trillion in treasuries last year. That was to fund our deficits. And in just the last two months, it's $480 billion. So they're adding a lot more treasuries. And this works its way into asset prices, which is driving these asset prices in the markets. And, 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 but it's driving up the costs more. So what's happening, Gary, people are, uh, this is what I call it. The investor is like a, a giant moth being attracted to the financial flame in the sky. And so they see, you know, the high interest rate. And, and so they're moving up towards that. But as they go up to you watch moths go to a flame, they get burned out. So this is, this is kind of my, my uh, analogy. They're going to continue to go to that light because it's, it's kind of pulling them up there due to high interest rates. But this is going to eventually burn out the system. And I, again, I think that happens. It starts to happen more after 2025. And people are going to know it as costs continue to go up. Food prices are going to go up. Energy prices are going to go up. Electricity prices are going up. Get this. U.S. natural gas prices, I've been talking about they're going to continue to remain low here in the, in the, in the short term. The electricity price has not come down retail electricity in the United States, even though natural gas prices have collapsed and we have moved more to natural gas generation for electricity. So I just think people are going to start saying, oh my God, costs are just going to continue to go up. So this is what how they're going to see it. This is how they're going to feel it. And it, uh, lastly, things you consume are going to inflate. Things you own are going to deflate. That's the nutshell. Finance is going to deflate. Uh, home prices are going to deflate. They're going to go fall down. It, but things you consume are going to continue to get stronger and stronger. So if 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 
your assets are decreasing, but the things you're consuming are increasing. You'll have less disposable cash and less availability to, to tap, you know, cash. Um, where's the breaking point for the consumer? Well, see, this is, this is very difficult because um, when you get into energy constraints and, and unemployment continues to go up, so you, it's very difficult. If you want to get more unemployment, you just start getting rid of computers because computers do a lot of work for humans that humans don't have to do. But right now, uh, so the breaking point, the, the breaking point is, and this is how I see it playing out right now, real estate prices are going up in residential, but not commercial. Have you seen right. the commercial prices are the canary in the coal mine? they're going to just get worse because as you get lower energy production, there's less trucks and cars and business moving around into these, into these urban environments, the city environment. So you're going to lead, you're going to need less commercial real estate. That's going to impact the residential in, uh, real estate market too. So I see as things get tougher for consumers, you've got four families living in four homes. One of those families is going to move into another family because costs are increasing. They don't need, they're just going to have, that's the way they're going to do it. So you're going to have more and more homes become vacant. It's not right now, but it, it's two, three years. I see that becoming more of a problem. That's how the, the typical consumer is going to deal with higher costs. They're going to have to move in together, more people in one home to, to afford these higher costs. That's how I kind of see it playing out. Yeah. Well, that, we could spend a whole uh, yes, we, we could spend a whole another hour on yes talking about unemployment, the consumer, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I I'm surprised it's taken as long as it has, but I I feel very similar. Um, you know, I just read an article, and I don't I'm not meaning for us to dive into it, but about people tapping their 401ks mm -hmm. and it's rising dramatically. So I mean, you know, at some point there's going to be avenues that are just shut off that are not currently shut off to them, you know, to go get a HELOC or to go tap their 401k, et cetera, right? credit cards. I mean, eventually those avenues will be shut off and they will not have another avenue to turn to. So. And, and, and I agree with you. And, and thinking about the last thing maybe to, to talk about is trying to uh, speculate where we're headed. At some point in time, the U.S. Treasury market auctions are going to fail at some point in time. So I think they know this is coming, which is why they want to go to the digital currencies, the, the, the central bank, you know, digital currencies. Because the Fed's talking about this right now, Gary, if we want to uh, fund our deficits, we issue a treasury and someone's got to buy that treasury. That's the way we're doing it. Well, we could get to a point where people don't want to buy those treasuries or bonds. So what happens? You, you, you stop doing that. The Federal Reserve takes over. They have on one ledger, they have an asset on the other ledger, a liability, and they issue money directly into the economy. They send it to your home. And that's what they've talked about. So no longer do we have to increase the debt. And then you've got to service that debt. But that is very inflationary. Yeah. So even if they figure out another way to kick the can down the road by going to central bank digital currencies, I think they're going to do that because these treasury markets are not going to be sustainable. Then they're going to come up with the next plan, and that's going to be very inflationary because that's direct m money. Because right now, a lot of people still hold those 20, 27 trillion in treasuries. Can you imagine if that money came into the market, how inflationary that would be? So. This is, you're right. This is how I think it's going to play out. It could be, it could get very bizarre, but it's going to be very inflationary, especially for things we consume. I've heard somebody coin this as Project Zimbabwe. <laughs> yeah. All right. So in another research article, you stated that if shale well economics weren't bad enough, now tack on the additional costs from all the recent mergers and acquisitions. And that investors don't realize that these large mergers and acquisitions are adding substantial new cost to each new well that will be added in the future. Will you speak into what your research is pointing to here? Yeah, there. Uh, unfortunately, the shale industry has wonderful investor relations that try to provide low break evens, and we've got all this oil forever. 
And we've probably tapped into most of the good, the, the, uh, we're tapping into about half of the high quality reserves in, in these shale basins. And Mike Shellman, who I, I spent a lot of time listening to, he was a 50 plus year veteran in the oil industry. He was mostly into conventional, and that was where most of the good money was made, the high energy return on investment, and paid taxes, paid government taxes. The shale, if you're lucky to get 150% return on investment of, a, of your money in shale over 10 years, that's good. A lot of these conventionals paid 10, 15 times their money. The problem is now with, Bear, uh, with Exxon buying Pioneer, and I believe uh, uh, Diamondback buying, uh, can't think of the name, I, I just lost, but by doing these mergers, they're paying a lot of money. So now it's adding about $3 million to the cost in the ground for that well. They got to pay an additional $3 million. And unfortunately, a lot of these drilling locations are, are, are less economic or will become less economic. So even though we're going to continue doing this, Gary, the shale industry is, is hitting, is starting to hit a peak. And I think we're going to be in a peak plateau for a bit for oil. Natural gas can continue because it's better to do fracking for, for natural gas than it is oil. The oil decline rate is like 40, 42 to 45% a year. Overall, shale gas is 30 to 33%. So it, it's just that the uh, physics of getting gas out of, sh out of shale formations works much better. Uh, and so this is the problem. Yeah. And so I think even though we're seeing a lot of mergers, to me, when I see mergers, that, that means there's problems. When you see mergers, there's typically problems. And I'll, I'll say this. Years ago, when Exxon and Mobil merged, one of the VPs reached out to me and said, we knew we knew we we're heading into problems with oil. That's why Exxon and Mobil merged. And, and so when you see mergers, they're trying to they're also trying to kick the can down the road. It doesn't make the company stronger. It it, it, it's, it allows the company to can, continue longer, and then they let employees go. It's kind of a, more of efficiency than it is for shareholder growth or the company. Yeah, it's interesting, Steve. According to the U.S. Energy Information Association total. World petroleum supply reached a record high in September 2023. It surpassed the previous peak from November mm -hmm. 2018. Yet you've been telling us all there's a catch. So that while the total world petroleum liquid supply hit a new high, crude oil production is down considerably and shale oil depletion has finally kicked in. I just, I, I just, I know we've been been talking about this in some of the other answers, but I really want to dive a little bit deeper into this aspect and and hear what your research is pointing to. You know, I wish I had one more chart, and it it shows that it shows the chart of conventional oil, uh, co condensate, heavy oil, tight oil, and then NGLs. And if you want to see an increase of of of, of oil or petroleum. It's NGLs. Well, NGLs really isn't oil, even though we can get petroleum products from oil. So the, the conventional oil, which is the high quality, the high energy return on investment, which actually runs the global economy, uh, that peaked in 2006. And even though it, it, everything fell in 2020, it's becoming up. It's still about four or five million barrels a day less than what it was in 2006. Interesting. What's made that up is all these other. But you don't really make diesel out of NGLs. And it's difficult to make a lot of diesel out of shale, tide oil. They mix it with the oil sands they, they bring in and they mix it and they make this Franken blend that the US refineries have difficulty making uh, diesel with that. So going forward, even though we may bring on more unconventional, the problem is what runs the global economy, Gary, is the diesel. That's what runs the global economy, not gasoline, diesel. And so right now, you look at the top four inventories in the United States, crude oil and gasoline are okay. Jet fuel's up. Crude oil is, I mean, diesel is, is at a five-year low. And so we, this is an ongoing problem we're going to have with the global supply chain that's run on diesel. And so going forward, even though we may bring on more production and have a higher number, the important number is that conventional 
And that conventional, I believe, is going to continue to decline. And so uh, this is the, the most important factor that the market is overlooking. Yeah. So this data is very critical to get out there. So people need to understand. I think so. what, yeah. People need to understand what's really happening. All right. So I have a few questions about the markets for you, Steve. NVIDIA's sure. market cap has grown by more than 1 trillion in less than a year. This just is not normal. What do you make of the major NVIDIA stock bubble and the ramifications if and when it pops? Two points. Uh, I would advise people to go to Nobody Special uh, on Twitter. You can also go to his YouTube channel. And he's been covering he's been covering some very interesting things happening behind the scenes, who's buying these chips. And, and even Jim Kanos said this on, an, uh, in, on CNBC a couple of weeks ago. He says when NVIDIA is now basically help funding, using their capital to help fund their own customers who are buying their chips, this is what happened in, in 1999. Same thing. And so yeah, NVIDIA, even though AI is interesting, you can't eat AI. Um, it doesn't drive you down the road. And so we're still a physical economy. We're still a physical economy. We wear we wear jeans. We put on shoes. AI will do some interesting things, but it's not going to be a ground changing thing. So Nvidia is in a bubble because it's doing the exact same things to fund growth and to bring in investors that was happening with the high tech stocks in 1999. And so I, I think it's going to be a trail of tears. Gary, anytime I see a chart look like the Empire State Building and the antenna, that is not sustainable. No. It, it just isn't even. And so, and I, even Bitcoin, I think, is not going to be sustainable with that, but that's a discussion for another day. So you're seeing um, a similar nifty 50.com bubble kind of scenario for the magnificent seven or six or five or four, whatever we're down to today. A a absolutely, because technology is an energy. People think, well, look at, look at technology. How much? I said, well, technology is a massive consumer of energy. And every time you do a Google search, it consumes energy. So if you think we're going to be ramping up more technology when we're starting to get into trouble with energy, we're sorely mistaken. Technology is going to get into serious trouble. Even though technology is going to be around, technology is going to get into trouble. And so I, I think, yes, I think these, these companies have, are, are like that financial flame, the moth. It's sucking everybody towards the light, the, the flame. They're going to get burnt out. So I, I do think we're going to see a, a, a severe correction in a lot of the high tech stocks. Yeah. So, Steve, there's so many risk points today, geopolitically, socially, economically, the markets and even the business cycle as we near the as we're either at the end or near the end of it. At some point, the world and you were talking about this earlier, the world is going to look to move away from building wealth towards protecting their wealth. What does that world look like to you? Where do investors move their money from and into what happens to the assets that have bubbled up? I know we've kind of danced around this, but mm -hmm. you know, can you speak deeper into this? I try to reflect on it because uh, I, I don't think, uh, I don't believe in a Mad Max scenario, even though that's, there's always that chance, right? Things start, really fall apart and it's every man for himself. I don't think anybody wants that. And I actually think the central banks, what they're doing is not nefarious. They're just trying to keep the lights on. And if they were honest with the public, things could get very, pretty ugly because no one's really talking about the energy constraints that we're hitting. So when you go into an energy plateau in constraint, you can't grow GDP. So if you can't grow GDP, how can you grow your wealth? That's what people don't get. Now, some some it, it, very smart people will grow their wealth, but not everybody. Because right now, you know, people bought real estate, prices go up. Everybody, you know, just goes along. And the thing is, only a, a select percentage of people might be able to build wealth in an energy plateau or declining environment. The, everybody else, they're, they're not going to be able to build wealth. Because all that finance out there, they think that's the wealth. It isn't. It's an IOU. So- I see a transition to physical assets because they hold their value. And why does a gold bar hold its value? This is what people need to understand. All that energy in all forms and stages that went to produce that gold bar, that value is locked in there. 
a 10 year bond needs 10 years of that economic activity just to pay that bond back. So one is an IOU based on future energy. And one, the gold bar, silver bar is based on the energy that was used in the past. That's why one is a real asset and one's more a liability. The market doesn't get it yet because we've had more, we've had energy growth. We haven't got to the point yet where it starts to plateau and we're in a permanent decline. And Gary, I mean, we're in a permanent decline, even though we can be in a plateau for a while. And here's the thing. If we remain in a plateau, that's not good for uh, finance. Mm-hmm. Because then it becomes they have to really increase it exponentially just just to continue the sustainability of that finance. So just not growing is very bad for all that finance out there. So that's kind of how I, I I see it playing out. Why people need to start moving into physical assets, uh, and I think if for lastly real estate, I think homes in the country uh, w- with a little bit of acreage, modest homes. I think that's going to be where people are going to move to because you can survive better than in a, in a metropolis that needs a tremendous amount of energy to run it. So that's kind of my thinking, but that's still, but that's still some years down the road. I'm not trying to get people worried. These things are going to take time. It's like a 300 mile train. It'll take time to get there. But we saw in the pandemic, people must start moving out of the cities because when they shut down, however, they start to shut down. You don't want to be in there. No. It's much easier to survive in a more rural or less populated area where you could grow a few uh, vegetables if you had to. So I think people need to start thinking about those kind of that they're thinking in that way. So you're not the only one who's come on uh, the podcast and and shared the exact same recommendation. <laughs> Um, so you're in good company, by the way. Um, so before we wrap up here and I ask Steve our final question, I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It is free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, the economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all of the interviews that we conduct each and every week. They all get posted there and everything is contained all in one free site. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise titled, if you don't own gold, you know, neither history nor economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive this free gift on us. Metals and Miners, by the way, we're a new channel, less than two months old. Please comment below. Tell us what information you want to hear about so that we can better tailor our expert interviews like this one to your needs or just to tell us how we're doing. If you've enjoyed the conversation with Steve as much as I have, please let him know. Hit the like button and subscribe button below and leave a comment. We really appreciate it. All right, Steve. So in wrapping up our discussion, I've got a two part final question for you. Tell us what you're what you're keeping an eye out for to likely happen this year. That's keeping you up at night. And secondly, what haven't we spoke about that you really want the viewers to know or consider for 2024 and going into 2025? I think, you know, one of the things that uh, it's always the the curveball um, and what happens if we get another with the banking or the banking or financial crisis it hits another gear like uh, we had that with Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns uh, and, and so that kind of keeps me up at night because some of these things or something out another pandemic or something can come out in left field that totally uh, shot it comes out from people don't really expect it and so life is going on, even though people are paying more, it's getting difficult. You know, some people are losing their jobs. Uh, we're seeing credit card delinquencies go up. All those, all these things are happening. But you can get some major event come in. I'm not, and I'm not talking about geopolitical, but major financial crisis or something that really disrupts the market. Yeah. And with this market now and a lot, a lot of leverage, that, that can be very disruptive. And so I think that's the thing that keeps me up. Um, uh, that it, that kind of event could happen that we're not expecting. 
So that's yeah. that's the first one. And the second one was the second one is yeah, is is what haven't we spoke about in today that you really want uh the viewers to know. The, we we touched on it in the beginning is to really think about what provides an asset its value. And we've talked all these different details and I try to give you what I think what provides value. But besides, you know, raw land and, 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 and things like that, what gives something its, its asset value is energy consumption. And that's human labor. Someone does a service that's burning oil or natural gas or electricity. And that's the capital too. It's all these things. So to me, you have to really figure out when you in going forward in the future to, to, to invest your money or what to do is what really gives something value. And right now with this massive increase in financial assets, they're not providing value. They're not, they're based upon a Ponzi scheme and Ponzi schemes don't end well. And so when people really start to think about what is the foundation of an asset or even collateral, because only, let me say this, if I, if you and I went to a bank, and we wanted to get a loan for a million dollars and you walk in and the banker says, okay, what are you going to put up for collateral? I got 500,000 in debt. I want to put up for collateral. He'll grab everybody else in that bank. They'll come in and they'll laugh at you because you don't have, that's not collateral to the bank. But you know what? If you're a major institution and you want to borrow money, you're going to put your U.S. treasuries as collateral. That's not an asset. That's a liability. Even though the shorter dated ones are, you can make them quickly into cash. But that's the difference. People, that's what's the most funny thing about this market. The foundation of collateral is U.S. Treasuries. And they keep adding about $2 trillion every year. That's not collateral. That's a liability. So that's what I want people to realize. What is the basis of an asset and what is real collateral? And so that is going to change over time. We need to understand more about that. So that's what I wanted to share. Yeah, I appreciate all of that. Steve, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your analysis, your ideas, and for coming on to the Metals and Miners podcast. It really has been so great to spend this hour with you. Would you tell the viewers where they can learn more about your work and how they can connect with you? Gary, thank you. I appreciate what you're doing because people don't understand, uh, even though it's frustrating to be in the miners right now, uh, they're the real producers of, 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 of real assets, the best assets, gold and silver. So I, I have the srsrockreport.com website. We have some free uh, member posts, but we I try to put all these details, how they're changing. And not many people are covering it, how it's an energy, the mining industry, the precious metals, what's happening with the precious metals, and even the economy and, and natural gas is very important. And I'm also busy on, on Twitter. I hate to call it X, but I'm, I'm busy on Twitter. And I put out these tweets every day just to inform people just like you why it's important to understand why we need to be in these, these physical assets. So I do really appreciate you being out there trying to, to share the word and we continue to do that. Hopefully we get some people because unfortunately it's going to be like a million musical chairs and only about 10, you know, 10 or 20 spots. That's how bad it's going to be. So people really need to start to wake up and transition out of that finance slowly, but it's important to do that. So thank you very much for your time, Gary. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, in other words, gold is going to be the last man standing, right? <laughs> yes. Gold yeah. and silver, the last gold. man. You're right. Yeah. All right. So uh, everybody go visit him on Twitter. Go to srsrockoreport.com. Um, the links will be up on the, on the um, video. It'll be in the description below. Connect with him in both places. I believe you also have a YouTube uh, where you yes. share videos, go watch the videos. He has very detailed analysis and research. It's very important that we are paying attention to what Steve is sharing. Steve, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Gary. We have to do it again in, uh, in three to six months to see how all this stuff is changing. Yeah, I would love it.